I'm going to tell you the most amazing thing that I know, which is this. Everything in the universe, from light to electrons to atoms, behaves like both a particle and a wave at the same time. All of the weird stuff you might have heard about quantum physics, Schrodinger's cat, God playing dice, spooky action at a distance, all of that follows directly from the fact that everything in the universe has both particle and wave nature. But if we look at the world around us, we, we see waves in water, we see particles of rock, and they're nothing alike. So what bizarre thought process would lead scientists to conclude that those two things go together? The answer is surprisingly mundane. Scientists are led to the conclusion that everything in the universe has this dual nature by the same process you use when solving a crossword puzzle. Now, I, I don't mean you're going to look the answer up in a dictionary full of words sorted by length or peek ahead at the answer key in the back of the in-flight magazine. I'm talking about the process you use to piece together the theme clues. Those, are, those annoying ones that cross the entire grid contain like a three-word phrase or dreadful pun. You're not going to guess those right away. You're not going to easily look them up. You have to piece them together from the simpler answers that cross them. And if all of those crossing clues fit together in a satisfying way, you can be confident that your theme answer, however improbable or annoying it might be, is also correct. The theme clue that leads to the dual nature of everything in the universe is what is the nature of the interaction between light and matter? The first person to seriously suggest a dual nature of light is Albert Einstein in 1905. But he's picking up on an earlier idea by Max Planck. Planck was trying to explain the, the spectrum of light emitted by a hot object like a light bulb filament. And he could do it only by resorting to a desperate mathematical trick. He pretended that the object was made up of little oscillators, each with a characteristic frequency, that could only emit light in discrete amounts, little units of energy that depended on that frequency. Planck never liked this idea very much, but Einstein picked it up and ran with it. He applied Planck's idea to the light itself saying that light, which everyone knew was a wave, is actually a stream of photons, little particles, each carrying a discrete amount of energy with the amount determined by the rule that Planck introduced. This is a radical suggestion. Einstein himself called it the only truly revolutionary thing he did in his career, but it works brilliantly to explain the way that light knocks electrons out of metals. Even people who hated the idea had to admit that Einstein had a point. So those are the first two steps towards the dual nature of everything in the universe. The next piece comes from Ernest Rutherford, working in Manchester. Ernest Rutherford and his students were shooting alpha particles at gold atoms, and they were shocked to see that some of the alpha particles bounced almost straight back. The only way this can happen is if the vast majority of the mass of the atom is concentrated in a tiny little space at the center. That cartoon atom you learn in grade school with electrons orbiting the nucleus like a tiny little solar system, that idea is Rutherford's. Rutherford's atom is great, except for one little problem, which is it can't possibly work. Classical physics tells us that electrons going around in a circle emit radiation. We use this all the time to generate radio waves and x-rays. Rutherford's atom should spray out an enormous burst of x-rays in a tiny instant before the electron spirals into crash into the nucleus. But Nils Bohr, who was working with Rutherford, pointed out that, you know, atoms manifestly exist, so maybe the rules need to change. Bohr suggested that for certain special orbits, an electron just goes around happily, not emitting any light. And atoms absorb or emit light only when moving between these special orbits, with the frequency of the light depending on the energy difference in just the way that Planck and Einstein introduced. Bohr's model fixes Rutherford's problems, it also is brilliant for explaining the spectrum of light emitted by hydrogen. But it has one little problem, which is there's no obvious reason why those orbits should be special. But a French PhD student named Louis de Broglie brought everything full circle. He said that if light, which everyone knew is a wave, behaves like a particle, maybe an electron, which everyone knew is a particle, should behave like a wave. And if you have electrons behaving like waves, it's easy to explain the rule that Bohr used to pick out his special orbits. This is a revolutionary idea. It's also the result of piecing together lots of small clues. And once you have the idea that electrons behave like waves, you can go and look for just that. By the end of the 1920s, physicists in the US and the UK had seen electrons behaving like waves. And these days, we have a beautiful demonstration of this from an experiment sending single electrons at a barrier with two slits cut in it. Each individual electron is detected at a specific place at a specific time, just like a particle. 
But all of the electrons together, as you repeat the experiment over and over and over, build up a pattern of bright and dark stripes that's characteristic of wave behavior. Richard Feynman said that this experiment embodies the central mystery of quantum mechanics. Once you have the idea of particles behaving like waves and vice versa, everything else follows from that, like words filling in a crossword grid. I tell this story not just because the physics is awesome, which it is, but because it says something important about the nature of science. When I tell people that I'm a physicist, one of the most common responses is, oh, you must be really smart, because my brain just doesn't work that way. That's very flattering to the vanity of a nerd like me, but it's just not true. Science is not a collection of arcane knowledge that's accessible to only a few people. Science is a process for figuring out how the universe works. You look at the world around you. You think about why it might work that way. You test your theory with further experiments and observations. And once you find out what happens, you tell everyone you know the results. This is one of the most fundamental human activities there is, and it shows up in all sorts of everyday activities. It's the process you use when solving a crossword puzzle. You look at the clue. You think about what might be a possible answer. You test your guess against the crossing clues. And if you're correct, then you write it in ink and leave it where other people can find it. This is a process that enables you to find the answers to questions that you can't guess right away and you can't look up. It lets you piece them together from other evidence and come up with, with answers to incredibly difficult problems. Sometimes that's a three-word phrase making a pun that fits a puzzle's theme. Sometimes that's quantum mechanics.